tour starts behind the Pantheon. Here we can see the remains of an imposing building erected by Agrippa. Look at the decorations with dolphins, tridents and shells. This basilica was dedicated to Neptune, god of the sea, thanking him for Agrippa's naval victories on behalf of Augustus. This wasn't a temple, but rather like a meeting hall or a classroom. In between of these two buildings you can see the church of Santa Eustachio. The origins of this church date to early Christian times, when it offered relief to the poor. In medieval times many charitable brotherhoods elected Santa Eustachio as their patron and had chapels here. The Romanesque bell tower is one of the few surviving remains of the medieval church and it was completely redecorated in the 17th and 18th century. For the better part of the Middle Ages, Rome must have had a hedgehog look. Hundreds of towers changed and dominated the skyline of Rome in the Middle Ages due to the rise to power of the new Roman noble families. Towers were never originally isolated like we see them today. They were always part of a larger complex which were owned by the great Roman families. They were a means by which the families could defend their land. This piazza is dominated by this extravagant spire. Its eccentric lines seems to revolve dynamically in a somehow chaotic manner. This is the spire of a masterpiece of Francesco Borromini, made for the church of Santivo la Sapienza. In 1632, Francesco Borromini was nominated architect of Rome's University La Sapienza. The complex needed a church, so he designed a church with a central plan resembling a six-pointed star. In true Baroque fashion he actually got much freedom and invented a concave facade that isn't at all squeezed in its context but actually takes the best out of it and it dynamically throws itself in the air. Borromini's symbology in the dome, for example, that covers the entire church, is that it brings everything in the perfection of the circle, 
the lantern where God is found. Outside, the lantern represents the lighthouse of Alexandria, but in this case it guides the Christian people and the sculptured flames that decorate it represent the journey. An important point of the building is given by the helicoidal movement that it gives in a very light way and it symbolizes the aspiration to the infinite. This is Borromini, subliminal transcendence. The Piazza Navona is placed just west of the Pantheon. It's considered the most beautiful square in Rome. In 2000 of years, this area has always been devoted to fun. Navona was originally a stadium for chariot races built by the Emperor Diocletian. During the Dark Ages, sports and festivities took place here. One such event was the climbing of a tall grease pole crowned by sausages and other goodies donated by the rich as a prize for the first person to reach the top. During the age of chivalry, jousts and tournaments took place in the square. The Renaissance witnessed other sports including bullfights. Over the next centuries, princess awarded diamonds to competing aristocrats. In the 17th century, someone plugged the drains and let the water overflow to form a lake. The prank was a huge success. For another 200 years, every weekend of August, the square was flooded and crowds gambled in the water. Everyone joined in, young and old, poor and rich alike. Nobles and high prelates splash about in a fancy carriages. All this ended when papal authorities restored and leveled the paving in the mid-1800s, but the festive mood persisted. No place was deemed more suitable than Piazza Navona for fairs, promenades, serenades and the famous puppet shows.
The center of this square is the perfect example of Baroque. You can feel the imprint of two great masters and bitter rivals, Bernini and Borromini. The splendid church of St. Agnes is a Borromini's creation. The fantastic fountain in front of it is by Bernini as well as other fountains and buildings all around contribute to the Baroque character. The church was made in the memory of the tragic episode occurred sometime during the Empire. According to tradition, a young girl was killed here for being a Christian. The young martyr's name is unknown, but on account of her sweetness, she acquired the name Agnes from the Latin Agnus or Lamb. Let's see Bernini's four enormous statues. These four river gods represent the four quarters of the world. Bernini enlivens the fountain with horses plunging through rocks and the flora and fauna of faraway lands. Asia is represented through the Ganges a bearded old man with an oar between his legs. Take a look to this palm tree, it's just one of the many exotic details. The next man is the Nile for Africa and he has his head covered since the river source was unknown back then.
Uruguay's Rio de la Plata, representing the Americas, tumbles backwards in shock. The god's exotic facial features are peculiar. Back in the 1600s, Europeans didn't have a clear idea of how to depict an American Indian. The spilled coins represent the easy to harvest wealth of the New World. The good-looking figure of the Danube represents the continent of Europe. He reaches back and grabs hold of the coat of arms of the Bernini's Pamphili patron.
The shape of the piazza still follows the outline of the original arena. Some of the stadium structures are visible embedded in a modern building. Though most of the original stadium has since been engulfed by newer buildings, you can still see pieces of the original framework in which these medieval houses would have been situated in the museum of the stadium of Diocletian at the northern end of the Piazza Navona. Thank you for staying with me. Subscribe right now so you won't lose all the next episodes. And also, you can enjoy the next tour so you can check all the videos in the channel. Ciao!